Jyoti Hermit. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of English, Even Christian College. Um, the topic of my lecture is an overview of Indian feminist poetry. It is uh, second paper, module 12. Feminism is a philosophy, an ideology, and a practice that privileges the concerns of women as members of society. Hence, texts produced under the influence of feminism written by either men or women will essentially be women-centric. Over time, feminist criticism or gynocritics as a discipline has evolved and developed methodologies to study women's writing. In our exploration of Indian feminist poetry, our endeavor must be to assess what modes of resistance this poetry adopts in order to rewrite, transform, reimagine, or undermine the projects set out for women by a patriarchal culture. We soon realize that feminism, as it plays out in the Indian context, is self-generated. It developed on its own without any borrowings from the West. It is only in the 60s and the 70s that modes of Western feminism impacted Indian feminism. Exploring sexuality and eroticism, interrogating hierarchies and patriarchy, questioning the inequalities and inequalities in marriage and in heterosexual relationships are the dominant ideas explored by feminist poetry in India. The Indic civilization is arguably 5,000 years old and poetry has been its first form of creative expression. Understandably, the corpus of Indian feminist poetry is very large. So, in order to stay focused, this module looks at Indian feminist poetry written by women and leaves out examining poems with feminist leanings written by men. It is worth emphasizing here that poetry written by Indian women of ancient times is surprisingly as modern and relevant as feminist poetry written by contemporary Indian women. More or less, the themes remain the same, indicating that culturally nothing much has altered in the Indian civilization and no dramatic upheavals have changed the face of Indian society from ancient to modern times. The first Indian woman poet is Lop Mudra, wife of sage Agastya, writing hymns in Sanskrit in the Rig Veda. Lop Mudra boldly asserts her sexual needs in a predominantly Brahminical and male-dominated age. We also have Buddhist nuns writing in Pali in the Theriyagatha. Here, a nun replies to the jibe of the god of death, Mara, and says that gender is in no way a hindrance in attaining enlightenment and nirvana. Mara says, that vantage ground the sages may attain is hard to reach. With her two-finger consciousness, that is no woman competent to gain. To which the nun replies, what should the woman's nature do to them, whose hearts are firmly set, whoever move with growing knowledge onward in the path. In the medieval period of Indian history, what is today called the Bhakti movement had its genesis in the south of India in the 6th century CE. It is characterized by the writings of its poet saints, many of whom were female. The Bhakti poets extolled a passionate love for the divine. From the 12th century onwards, the Bhakti movement gradually spread to other regions of India. From the central western regions of India, it moved northwards and to northeast India, coming to an end roughly in the 17th century. The Bhakti poets wrote in their regional vernaculars. By now, writing devotional literature in Sanskrit, as was the practice, the immense contribution of the Bhakti poets to Indian literature is that they help develop the re regional languages as well as the modern Indian languages, which now are around almost 1500 in number. Many male Bhakti poets speak in women's voices. Perhaps 
They believe that women's nature and their attitude of surrender was the way an individual ego should approach the Godhead. The Bhakti movement was the religious as well as a social revolution. It interrogated the hierarchies of class, caste, gender and religion. Kabir's Dohas ask how, although circumcision may differentiate men, does it differentiate a Hindu woman from a Muslim one? Similarly, the sacred thread may reveal a man's religion, but would it be a woman's? Akamaha Devi was born in Udutali, a village near Shimoga in present-day Karnataka. She wrote in Kannar. She was initiated into Virasevam while still a young girl. In her story, which is rich with legends of her independent mind and soul and her fearless way of living while having devoted her life to the service of her god, Chinnam Malika Ranujan. Her poems are a direct address to her god or others and are born out of lived, felt experiences. She is the precursor of the confessional school of poetry in India and her poems are fine examples of a creature feminine. The intense, illicit love relationship that Akama Devi establishes with her god Siva is both her rebellion against the role forced upon her by society as well as a means to spiritual liberation. A few lines from the poem, not one, not two, not three or four. Not one, not two, not three or four, but through 8,400,000 vaginas have I come. I have come through unlikely worlds guzzled on pleasure and pain. Whatever be all previous lives, show me mercy. This one day, O oh Lord, white as jasmine. Akka Mahadevi's life and poems make for an engaging comparison with the North Indian Bhakti poet Mirabai. Mirabai was upper crust and married off into a Rajput royal family. She too negated marriage and the norms of civil society and wandered off with saints and ascetics in her search for her lover, God, Giridhanarag or Krishna. Much like the modern day Princess Diana story, legends has it that the enraged royal family made several attempts on the life of Mira, but she escaped unscathed. Mirabai's poetry becomes all the more interesting for contemporary readers because the places and temples associated with her are still extant and functioning in Rajasthan and Gujarat. One may visit these sites and marvel at how a high-born lady travels such long distances like an ordinary person in those medieval times. Pain and suffering of separation are the hallmarks of Meera's poems in Rajasthani and Gujarati. Although living the life of a rebel, in contrast, her poems in gentle language are animated by household images of upper class life and an attitude of complete surrender to the male deity she adores. Many of her poems are set to music by her. She specifies the particular rag that the poem must be sung in. This makes one believe that Mirabai was bringing into play a sharp critical intelligence while composing her poems as the rags evoke moods and images that Mira desired to reinforce into the structure of the poem. I would like to quote a couple of lines from the poem, I am true to my Lord. I am true to my Lord, O my companions, there is nothing to be ashamed of now. Since I have been seen dancing openly. In the day, I have no hunger. At night, I am restless and cannot sleep. Leaving these troubles behind, 
I go to the other side. A hidden knowledge has taken hold of me. My relations surround me like bees. But Meera is the servant of her beloved Giridhar. And she cares nothing that people mock her. Folk songs in all of India's languages and dialects constitute an almost unmappable hinterland of literary riches. Most of these folk songs are composed by women while going about the daily business of living a family and community life. These songs cover every aspect of life and run through the entire range of human emotions. In almost all languages and dialects, there are songs that scorn and question meaningless rituals, oppressive impositions, and unfair, unfair conventions of a male-dominated culture. These songs are ageless and their feminism is startling and engaging. There is an urgent and pressing need for researchers to do interlanguage translations of these folk songs so that they are accessible to an increasingly large swathe of people. I would like to quote a couple of lines from the poem, You Nurtured Me to Be a Carefree Bird, O Mother. You nurtured me to be a carefree bird, O Mother. You counted the days to make me fly, O Mother. Now the cage is bare without a bird, O Mother. Without me, your home is empty, O Mother. Who shall coax me to eat, O my Mother? Who shall wake me from sleep, O Mother? Who will feel the yearning of my heart, O Mother? For they shall only exaggerate my words, O Mother. And they shall make fun of them, O Mother. O oh, their harsh words I cannot bear, O Mother. They shall flay my skin to the bone, O Mother. O oh, how I was afraid of the dark, O Mother. But now I have freed you from my care, O Mother. And when the first hibiscus blooms, O Mother, darkness shall reign on your heath, O Mother. The camel drinks with its long neck, O Mother. But you have none of the cares, O Mother. If for the sake of convenience, we take 1757 and the Battle of Plassey as the commencement of British rule in India, we see that it was in the first hundred years that Britain extended its military might in India the most, exploited it economically and had the maximum cultural impact on Indians. In the late 19th and early 20th century, British expansion and might was also accompanied by the birth and evolution of the Indian nationalist movement that would eventually replace the Raj. In the 19th century, British utilitarians like Thomas Babington Macaulay exhibited a sense of cultural mission and attempted social engineering in India based on ideas of the European Enlightenment. Some Indians were as eager as the British to spread the English language, codify Indian law according to British legal principles, and reform oppressive socio-religious customs with British help. What was the impact of all this on Indian women? Middle-class Indian women could now aspire to a life of education and reading and writing. The Babus or the Brown Sahibs that the British created among the Indians to help govern their sprawling empire are satirized by Mokshudaini Mukhopadhyay in her Bengali poem, Bengalir Babu. She was the sister of W.C. Banerjee, the first president of the Indian National Congress and the daughter of a renowned lawyer. Mokshudaini had the good fortune of growing up in an atmosphere of learning and her writing caused quite a stir in the literary world of her time. Sarojini Naidu, 
poet and politician is a towering figure in India's cultural history, active as a close associate of M.K. Gandhi and Gopal Krishna Gokhale at a time when India was in the grip of nationalist fervor and battling bitterly for independence from the British Empire. Though her life and her politics encompass all the shades of feminism, her poetry appears genteel, effete and exotic, harking back to the world of snake charmers and rope tricks. However, Naidu's contribution as a poet rests in the realm of the imagination. In her poems, Naidu is able to evoke a world of enchantment, wonder and surprise at a time when the entire world was trapped in the black hole of mechanized, industrialized, worn, torn, brutish modern civilization. Naidu has often been referred to as a traditional feminist because her poetry is relatively conservative, while she is a firebrand champion of women's rights in the political arena. As a creative artist writing in English, the colonizer's language, Naidu is a product of her times. An intergenum where an Indian deeply scarred by colonialism was neither traditional nor modern. Hence, Naidu's poetry defies easy categorization. I would like to recite a couple of lines from the poem, from the temple, a pilgrimage of love. If you call me, I will come, swifter, O my love, than a trembling forest deer or a panting dove, swifter than a snake that flies to the charmer's thrall. If you call me, I will come, fearless what befall. If you call me, I will come, swifter than desire, swifter than the lightning's feet, shod with plumes of fire. Life's dark tides may roll between, or death's deep chasms divide. If you call me, I will come, fearless what betide. The freedom movement of Indian independence had given ample opportunity to women of all classes and sections of society to step out of their homes and come out into public spaces to fight for a free nation. However, independence in 1947 was also accompanied by the partition of the country into India and Pakistan and a genocide wherein women and children suffered the most. The first elections to be held in independent India in 1951 were based on universal suffrage. Also, one of, one of the first initiatives of constitutional feminism the new government of India took was the Hindu Code Bill that tried to create a uniform law for women wherein they would be guaranteed some rights to property and succession and to be treated at par with men in matters relating to marriage and divorce. This law was eventually passed in 1955. However, by the late 1960s, most of the sheen of Nehruvian socialism wore off. Economic growth fell short of expectations. Urban unemployment increased. The rural poor resisted changes the, that the bureaucrats and planners envisaged for them. Prices spiraled. Major peasant rev revolts and riots affected parts of the country. This was a time that brought women out of their homes again, with them forming women's organizations and forcing the government to set up and consider women's issues and women's questions. A state of emergency was declared by the government in 1975 and after the emergency was lifted in 1977, women's movements 
and women's struggles in India gained momentum. By the 1980s in India, caste and communal conflicts were on the rise together with violence against women. Jaya Prabha is an Indian poet and feminist writing in Telugu. She has published seven volumes of poetry and also several texts of literary criticism. A selection of love poems written by her have been translated into English by P. V. Narsimha Rao, former Prime Minister of India, as unforeseen affection. Her poetry has been widely anthologized in both Telugu and in English. During the freedom movement, as well as after the formation of the sovereign nation of India, B. R. Ambedkar worked tirelessly for the cause of the victimized and the marginalized depressed castes, the untouchables, the Harijans and the Dalits of India. As the architect of the constitution of India, he drafted provisions and spearheaded legislations that promised social equality and justice for all. In the early 1970s, groups calling themselves Dalit Panthers became active in Maharashtra. They drew inspiration from Marxist ideology, the Bhakti movement, and the Afro-American civil rights and Black is Beautiful movements in the United States. Soon, an impressive body of Dalit literature started evolving the writing thick with anger and resistance. Dalit women too started registering their protest in their writing. In India, a Dalit woman is triply oppressed, crushed by the weights of class, caste and gender. Dalit women's writing is a minefield of simmering rage and discontent and an unignorable area of study for its special brand of feminism. Here we look at extracts from a long poem in Marathi by a Dalit woman poet Jyoti Lanjevar, who attracted widespread attention in the 1980s. Lastly, let us cast a glance at women poets of the Indian diaspora, poets of Indian origin or ancestry born or settled outside of India. These poets have had to negotiate questions of Indianness, identity, sacrosanct nativity or dynamic nationality, gender issues and self-affirmation in all of their hyphenated experiences. This has given birth to a fairly large body of poetry full of complexity, paradox and richness wrapped around themes of exile, nostalgia, rootlessness, alienation, racial and gender discrimination, marginalization, problems of assimilation and cultural hybridization. The poetry of diasporic Indian women poets examines their particular existential dilemmas through gendered lenses. Let us read a poem by Michelle Cahill, a Goan Anglo-Indian who now lives in Sydney, Australia, in order to facilitate an understanding of the issues that animate diasporic poetry by Indian women. The poem is named Parvati in Darlinghurst. So I lay on the body of a pale shiver. He spoke not a word, bothered perhaps by my nut-brown skin. My slow dance calmed his electro-shuffle. A slap of limbs pinned him down to my earth. I hadn't bathed in sandalwood, flouting legend with a preference for S.T. Lauder. The mool's crescent tangled my hair. My breasts were bare, our timing synchronized. Night fizzled, vanishing into day. The club's hypnotic rhythm subdued. We scorn the Puranas, Atris, no Himalayan cave, but a hotel bed 
I had draped with stockings, lingerie and the crystal eyes of a third eye. I admit that's why I spoke with the speed of an antelope. It seems the Acharyas were mistaken. I hadn't dated for marriage or adultery, nor with a wish to deck his house with flowers or sweep his floors. I am too busy, I declared for dalliance or abstract gossip. I have no interest in honeybees or birds. All I wanted was a good time. I swear as the river is my sister that this guy was not my sun or my sky. No way did it ever enter my mind to have his kids. His first wife's ashes are scattered all over the city. God damn it, Shiva is a walking disaster. Whatever he touches, he burns. Restraining him with handcuffs, I said, Forget it, babe. Your lingam and my yoni are made for one thing only, improper and unchaste. It's little more than conjecture to think our sweaty helix could ever be whole. Then I offered to grind and gyrate him silly, suspend our want indefinitely, and he fell utterly silent with this new meaning. Cahill's poem is one of the best examples of parody and juicence. Kahil overturns the grand narratives of Parvati and Shiva on its head and uses the terminology associated with the legend of Shiva and Parvati in a parodic and subversive manner. The poem is hilarious, so well has the poet been able to use irony, parody and satire to tickle the reader's cosmic sensibility. Grave somber and serious words, red Sanskritized words like third eye, lingam and yoni are demystified and reduced to a ridiculous crude reality. Postmodern feminism gangs up to strip the romance of eroticism associated with the love legend of Parvati and Shiva down to the very basics of the act of sex between a man and a woman. The message of the poem of, is usance. Sorry, I would like to do it again. Postmodern feminism gangs up to strip the romance of eroticism associated with the love legend of Parvati and Shiva down to the very basics of the act of sex between a man and a woman. The message of the poem is usance. The contemporary Parvati will indulge in sex for no other reason than the sheer joy of your lingam and mayoni, made for one thing only, improper and unchaste. The poem's feminist poetics registers a paradigm shift in the age of metropolitan life, resulting in the lapse of a grand order replaced by an arbitrary personal order. In its own unique way, this poem manages to further the cause of feminist activism through writing.